What's up guys? Welcome to Ride the Coffee Bean. Today I have a, a pretty cool thing happening. I'm standing right outside of the Lamasoko Academy. Lamasoko is my favorite brand of uh, espresso machines. And so uh, when I'm in Florence where they make it, of course I have to come and, uh, and see what it's all about. Learn a little bit about the history of the company. So uh, join me on a tour of the facilities and learn about the story of La Marzocco. All right, so welcome to Academia. Academia is a cultural hub that was created by La Marzocco, which as I like to define is a sort of a melting pot for the whole community of coffee lover, friends of La Marzocco, distributors, suppliers and so on. And this is a very dynamic place. We have first of all this exhibit area that we're going to see in a bit. But we do a lot of activities and experiences like tasting, cupping experience. We could say even almost academic lessons regarding the history of coffee and how it developed worldwide. And a huge part of academia is also dedicated to sustainability. In fact, up in the terrace, we host a population of bees. We have lavender all over, and we do have an hydroponic cultivations of salads. Because one of our goals is also trying to unshorten the distance that is daily increasing between the city centre and the countryside. And showing that in a very cheap way and super sustainable, is it possible to have a healthy lifestyle, we could say. This here is where we welcome our guests, is what we like to define the vintage bar. Because you have to know that La Marzocco, until the end of the 80s, was not just doing the espresso machine, but was also doing the whole surrounding of it. So design and construction of entire situation like counter bar, professional kitchens, restaurants and so on. Because the founders of La Marzocco are two brothers, the Bambi brothers, one of which had a huge knowledge regarding carpentry and design, and he was in charge of design in the situation, while the other one focused on the espresso machine. But definitely the starting point for our company was the dual buyer system. So um, when talking of brewing and espresso, there are some principles that needs to be satisfied and temperature inside of the machine is fundamental. It's considered to be a good water temperature for the extraction of the espresso, a water that measures between 89 and 96 Celsius degrees. When we consider a good quality steam, we're making a cappuccino or any milk based beverage, and historically speaking, all espresso machine had just one boiler that did this dual function. So there was a sort of compromise in terms of temperature. Neither you had the perfect espresso at the perfect temperature, neither you had the perfect steam. Until 1971, when Lamar Zocco patented the dual boiler system. So we basically split in half the normal boiler, having one boiler just for the steam and one boiler just for the extraction of coffee. This technology takes the name of GS, which in Italian would be uh, Gruppo Saturo, in English it would be Saturated Group, referring to the other two chambers that are connected to the coffee boiler. Okay, the starting point is definitely this machine here. Leonardo Zocco, as I was saying before, was founded by the Bambi brothers, but the Bambi brothers were not born as uh, producers of espresso machine. Bambi brothers were metal shaper. So they um, used to work metal just within hammer and hammer, and they were doing some external part of cars and ambulances. And from time to time, they did get some external commission in order to bring more money home. One of these commission came from the entrepreneur man called Mr. Galletti. Um, they had the drawings of this machine and simply wanted someone who could realize around 10 units to see if first bars were interested in buying uh, professional machines. The Bambi brother fell in love with the making of espresso machine and found Lamar Zocco the following year in uh, 1927 and basically never stopped producing an espresso machine. So even though we refer to this as an espresso machine, this is actually a huge mocha pot because the entire machine needed to be put on the stove gas and it was all just one vertical boiler. Water was filling from the top. You would brew the espresso through the classic porta filter, we could say, but through a valve that is behind you. And what nowadays we consider to be the steam wand was actually the outlet of the pressure. So Barista had to remember to open up the valve, because otherwise this would be like a bomb, basically. And these are all reasons why Mr. Galletti will abandon the project after a bit, because he thought it was more a sort of obstacle for baristas than something helpful. But the Bombay brother kept producing new vertical machines until 1939, when they presented the first horizontal boiler machine ever done. 
problem is that timing was not the best because uh, soon Italy will enter the Second World War and of course during war years the production of espresso machine stopped and so once the patent expired they didn't have enough money to renew it and so they lost it. During war years the Bambi brother uh, didn't produce any machine but kept drawing new ones so when we arrived in the 50s when war was over and there was a the economic boom period, we arrive at the lever machine. Lever machine um, were neither an innovation or a patent of Lamarzocco. They were extremely um, common in that period because they were um, convenient for bars and coffee shops at the period. Because of course after years of work, coffee that came from the other part of the world was not that much available. And the few quantity that you could find were extremely expensive. And you have to think that we pass from a two bar pressure to a 12 bar pressure. This allows the baristas to use a minimum quantity of powder and extract two good espressos in the way we mean it. So it's from this machine on that we can talk of proper espresso. So cream on top of coffee, oil extraction, and the espresso as we mean. And between this machine here and the GS there, or better say between the 50s and the 70s, we pass from being a small workshop in the city center of Florence to expand a little bit our market. And it's in those years that we end up here in Pian di San Bartolo with even a shift in the management. So the Bambi brothers retire and Subenter is the chief of Blamarzocco, one of the two uh, son of one of the two founder, which is Piero Bambi. And Piero has been our product designer since the early age of 16 years old until 2020 when he passed away. The last machine that he designed is the KB90 that uh, was released in 2019. So we can easily see an entire lifetime dedicated to the design of his press machine. And with Piero, lines of Lamarzocco became, I think, recognizable worldwide. Piero was a huge fan of functionality over beauty. So machine, first of all, needs to be very easy sharp line, almost all stainless steel, because these are machines that are meant to last as long as possible. So they have to overcome the different trends and the different styles of the period. And more than this, he, is one, he wanted functional machines. So machines that are easy to clean, easy to use for baristas, but more than this, machines need easy to use even for technicians. Because if the espresso machine is the core of an entire activity, we cannot allow that this machine can be removed from the bar itself. Technicians have to be fast in what they have to do. And of course, the machine on the inside needs to be very organized and precise, because otherwise if you have all cableage going around, it's a little bit difficult to put his hand and fix if something is broken. And so we arrive here in Pian di San Bartolo, we change our management, we have Piero on the left, and we start the production of dual boiler machines. This machine is of, is called GS, which of course takes the name from the technology inside. So this is the first machine having dual boiler system and flow meter inside of it. And with this machine, we become exclusive suppliers of Starbucks. In those years, while we were producing this machine, there was a young entrepreneur going around digitally, that is Kent Bakke, that at the moment is one of our shareholders that had this idea of buying Italian espresso machine, considered as the motherland of espresso, and bringing it to the US to do a sort of reselling. So he took one of our GS to Dave Olson, while Dave Olson was opening the first Starbucks. So as I like to say, for a series of luckily events, we became exclusive suppliers of Starbucks. Our collaboration uh, lasted long. We closed our collaboration in 2007. And not for what everybody thinks, yeah, Starbucks, not good coffee, fast coffee shops, and so on. But actually because Starbucks realized at one point that he no longer had uh, baristas considering working there as a full-time professional job. It became the part-time job, the student job that you did during summer. The Starbucks was investing a lot of money in training their baristas, of course. It's on latte art, how to breathe espresso properly, and so on. So he said, why? Do I have to keep on paying trainings that for my uh, uh, employee if then after two or three months they simply go away? I'll pay more La Marzocco, but please Marzocco make me super automatic machine. So I have, they simply have to press the button cappuccino and the, the job is done. And even though they represented the majority of our market in that period, Piero Bambi, which was a very steady man in his action and moral values, 
said no to them because it was going against our philosophy behind the machine. Fiat was always saying, yes, the machine needs to be highly performative, but it's the hand of the barista that makes the difference. And this is something that you cannot remove from the machine itself. Still, it was a tough period because losing big part of the market from one day to another is not an easy task. In fact, part of this building at the moment is a private house because we had to solve something in order to keep on buying raw material, keep on paying wages. But here in Italy we say, quando si chiude una porta si apre un portone. So when you close the door, you open a bigger one. And it's actually thanks to Starbucks that then we became the company that we're today. Because Starbucks in 2007 was filled with linea classico logo. So when changing supplier, all of our machines were going back to the various distribution and supplier where they took it. And we noticed that a huge secondhand market was taking place. It's in that moment that we realized that there was a niche and a huge part of the market, actually, that didn't have any producers satisfying their request. And we're talking of the high quality and specialty coffee reality. And more than this, they had our same philosophy behind the machine. Research for value, research for the best espresso possible. It's not La Marzocco that makes the best espresso possible, but La Marzocco is the means through which a barista can obtain the perfect espresso. And the other aspect is that buying secondhand machine and seeing that they were working properly as brand new one, the liability of our machine is probably the biggest aspect and probably the, the best adjective to describe our company. And, and so from then on was a easier task for us. In fact, that's why in 2008 we released the Strada machine. Strada machine was a, a, a machine that we produced together with baristas. We gathered around 10 baristas from Specialty Coffee Reality and we asked to design their own drum machine. And then we produce it and it's still an icon in the, in the sector. So you have to know that here in Florence, we're very proud of being Florentine and even the Bambi brothers were very proud of being Florentine. The Marzocco, the original Marzocco, is a statue from the Donatello. It's the lion, strength, with the shield, the fence and the symbol of Florence, which is the lily. During the Medici period, uh, whenever we were winning a battle or conquering a new city, we used to put this lion in the central square of the city conquered. So what the Bambri brothers were aiming to do was to conquer more bar possible by putting La Marzocco in each counter bar. And on the other hand, um, Florence has been one of the first republic to uh, be established in old ancient history of Italy. So this is known to be a very democratic sign. And our company developed in the 30s, where initially we had the dictatorship of Mussolini. So it was also their ways to say we're against any form of totalitarianism, of course, in the only way possible without risking too much. So Piero had this van. He did an hydraulic and electronic system in it, put all the lever machine on, and stopped in front of each bar in the city center of Florence so that barista could just exit, try the machine, and go back to work. And as I was saying, these are all lever machine. And the news with lever were crema. So you won't see anywhere reads an espresso machine. It says Macchine Crema Cafe, coffee cream machine, because it was the news, basically. This is the coolest car ever. Look at all these espresso machines and espresso grinders. It's amazing. This is the machine with probably the latest technology the Lumber Zocco developed. So here we're having um, ProTouch Steamwind, those that doesn't go further than 30 Celsius degree. And here we're having the straight in portafilter filter technology. So now it's, um, porta filters are missing and I'm still trying to understand why, but still, you have to imagine to having a porta filter and you simply insert it and you close it up and you close it, to put it down and you remove the porta filter. This because we conduct a study and we saw the Almost 10 years, uh, after 10 years of work, the, body, the barista is likely to develop the carpental tunnel disease. So in order to help the baristas as much as we can, we develop a porta filter in which you don't need to do the bayonet insert, but simply to insert it frontally. Plus, baristas love this machine because it comes with the auto flush paddle. So if you pull down this paddle, the shower of the group cleans itself automatically with a mix of water and steam. Because trying to help the baristas in their workflow, maybe in bars where they're having 
lots and lots and lots of, of espresso studio, this is easier to use than other machines. And this is the last machine designed by Piero. And it's called KB90 because it stands for Kent Bakke. We're not the most creatives in terms of names. <laughs> <laughs> this machine, the KB90, is probably my favorite espresso machine to work on because of this system. It is brilliant. None of us would be here if it wasn't for the bean itself. So coffee grows in the intertropical bend of the world, so quite near the equatorial line. And it's predicted that by 2050, the equatorial line will rise up here, more or less. So where at the moment there are favorable weather conditions for the developing of the plant will no longer be. In fact, it's predicted that by 2050, uh, the global production of coffee will reduce significantly. We're talking of 70% less in South America, 60% less in Africa, and 50% left in, less in Asia. Of course, coffee will not disappear, but we're going to face a new generation of producers. And we're talking of this area of the world, more or less. In fact, in Sicily and in Tenerife, thanks to the volcanic soil of the Etna and the Teide, they already did a harvest of natural coffee. Which, from one point of view, is amazing because we're going to find new blends, we're going to find new hybrids, new types of coffee. But what really concerned us is that, first of all, we're talking of an area of the world which is strongly urbanized. So, probably we will never be capable of um, satisfying the entire request that coffee has. So probably coffee will become luxury good in the following year. And more than this, we're pretty much concerned of who nowadays is the producers of coffee. Because we're not talking of something that they started doing yesterday and are still in time to go back and change completely the type of economy. We're talking of centuries and centuries of histories of those countries, nationals' economy based on the exploitation of the bean. And we don't know where it's going to happen. I've talked to a producer, a Brazilian producer, and he told me that just in 2022 he already lost the 30% of his annual production due to the dryness of this year, for example. All right, so um, in this room, we wanted to represent the different situation in which coffee can grow. So, of course, especially when we're having tours with newbies or local people that don't know what coffee is, in a way it is scary for them because you tell them about social conditions, living conditions, wages and stuff, and they're like, okay, I'm never going to drink coffee and what, never again in my life. That's not the point. I mean, coffee, as every other agricultural resource, presents itself in different situations. Not everything is unsustainable, let me say. So in this room, we try to be a sort of embassy for places of origin. At the moment, we're having Guatemala, Brazil, Ethiopia and India. They represent the four areas of the world in which coffee is produced. They represent the four different types of terroir, which are more, most common. So we have um, volcanic soils in Guatemala, we have terra rocha in Brazil, we have sedimentary soil in um, Ethiopia, and we have um, red soil also in uh, India with the presence of iron, parties on the inside, that of course affect the plant of coffee in different way, giving different aroma. Acidity in Guatemala, we have a lot of sweetness and chocolate flavors in Brazil. We do have a lot of aromas and exotic sensor in Ethiopia, and we do have a lot of robusta in India. But what we wanted to mark is that all of these four countries have a cupping score which is above 80. This means that all of these countries are sustainable and are producer of specialty coffee not just in terms of quality, but also in terms of quality of life for the workers there. So. What kind of plants do you have in the, in the greenhouse? We're having plant platanos, banana trees, coffee trees, and then we have what is defined to be shadow trees, which I think are those, and it recreates the basically the atmosphere of a coffee farm in Costa Rica in this case. Now our banana trees need to be cut off probably because they're way too high to, the, 
to the, the sky music. And these are all coffee. We already did, I think, one of two harvests of our coffee. But it's not the best feed that you can find around, but still, we're very proud of it. And this is the lung of Academia. So the oxygen that we're breathing is provided by the greenhouse. And here you see what we were talking about before, so you have the whole world, where it's going to be next producers and who is no longer going to produce. <laughs> Scandinavia, it's going to you're going to be a producer sooner in Nor Norway. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact I've heard that who's knowing this is now buying new fields, where at the moment... You who? who heard about these aspects and the fact that no, no longer this area of the world will be producers of coffee is now buying fields in the northern part of the world hoping to find an investment but still, we don't know, we don't know we have an agronomist who's taking care of this green bean here we have where our coffee team is usually doing some research and experiment on usually how beans interact with each other, or maybe how water affects the different beans, different types of abrogations. Then we have the roastery. Um, that's where we receive all the, all the samples of uh, green coffee. Here we, we don't sell coffee, we will never sell coffee, but we roast a lot uh, in Scarperia factory. Now we're working more than 400 people that drinks a lot of coffee. So my colleague Marco, the, the roaster, um, is going on a volume of about 60 80 kilos per week just for interior use <laughs> and we roast for uh, degustation and the experience we, we use for courses uh, trainings etc here is where we receive the samples we have some uh, nice tools like the Kava or, uh, or Cafe Logic. We have a collaboration with, uh, with the guys of uh, Ona Coffee that are helping to develop this. Uh, or the, the Provatino. We often host uh, uh, rosters from the, um, the area that maybe cannot afford those, those tools to roast their samples for free. And um, there are lots of uh, research uh, projects like uh, with the University of Rome and University of Florence uh, to catch the chemistry in uh, coffee. Uh, we send all the cup of excellence uh, to understand what does the terroir gives to the cup, the soil uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we, um, we use our mouth and they use the spectrochromograph to understand uh, uh, what happens in uh, in the cup from a chemical point of view? That's really fascinating. One of the yeah, it is. Uh, we we feel very lucky to to dig to have the possibility to dig so deep in, uh, in things that are starting and being studied. So very happy. Yeah, that's the the production area. Uh, everything is done with this five kilo probat that of course cannot be filled with five kilos <laughs> like a washing machine. Uh, and that's the only uh, one that can be connected with the uh, with Cropster. And this is the one we use for the like high-end batch one. You know, we need to, to roast uh, less, like one kilo or uh, eight, 800 grams. We use the Probat. That uh, just works in metal, so there's no possibility to use Cropster or replicate the, the profiles. This is our small stock. Uh, we always uh, have some. Uh, <laughs> when my colleague Marco will be back, uh, he has to <laughs> roast a lot of uh, new things. We follow all the trends in the market, even the ones we don't like. So, all in, from infused coffee to dark roasters, sometimes we roast on purpose for research and development when. Uh, uh, sometimes they need extreme coffees, uh, like uh, over the second crack, or um, very light roast, very dense, uh, to um, to develop, for example, the grinders, uh, or uh, to see how the pre-infusion works with very different coffees, uh, uh, and everything is done here. Uh, that's sorry for the mess. I was changing the setup. This is uh, the sensory lab where we make. Uh, sensory courses and trainings, the degustations for our uh, customers. Uh, we have different formats that, um, you know, the, the problem, the problem, so the problem, but uh, 
sometimes it happens that the groups are very heterogeneous. So I can get in the same table uh, a very new buy uh, and uh, the word roasting champion, and we, we have to make them both happy in uh, in the same way. So we a very um, like light and playful um, uh, standards of, uh, of degustations. We try and dress something um, for whom is, um, is is getting it, and uh, uh, is also where we make the, the cuttings from uh, for uh, quality control or uh, when we have to choose a coffee to buy. And when things comes um, more serious, there's the possibility to make everything dark. Uh, we have red lights uh, and uh, so yeah, that's uh, sensory lab. And here we have the espresso lab when we displayed the, the past and future of La Marzocco, so the two classic, the, the the classic and the classic uh, asset uh, with our mod bar. That's where we make lot art courses or uh, training for espresso brewing. Uh, uh, and we host uh, SCA courses and trainers so external. We don't have an SCA trainer here. Mm. So that's good. Then we have our pottery lab. Pottery lab. Pottery lab. You First, make we have the material library where um, we're having the machine for bespoken machine. So you see, there's all different materials available. So here is where they project the different machine done at the officine, at the downstairs. So you can design your own machine with the materials yes. here? Yes. And here we have the pottery lab. So the educational leader of our coffee expertise, which is not as Milova, um, she has also a degree in design. And uh, she's have always, let's say, worked with ceramics, and so now she's providing all the cups that are at the ground bar and available in the shop. She makes all here. It's the brand new Linea Micra. It has a plastic uh, bayonet. That's pretty interesting. The reason is because um, this is specifically made for home use, um, and at home you want it to heat up faster, and uh, metal takes a while to heat up. So uh, they made it out of plastic, and you can also put it in the dishwasher. The, the reason they created the Mikra in the first place was because what was supposed to be the home machine, the Linea Mini, uh, very often is used in small coffee shops. Like, for example, Garage Coffee in Verona, they have uh, Alamasoco Mini, Linea Mini. Um, so they wanted to make one that you can't really use in uh, commercial uh, establishments because the, the, the boiler on this is too, too small. So you can only make like 10 coffees in a row before you have to wait for it to refill, which doesn't make sense in commercial settings. And it's cheaper, about 3,000 euro, I think. And this is one of my favorite machines, it's the GS3. It's the same machine that we have at uh, the new coffee bar that Longyear opened, Jochen. So this is a unique model the guys of uh, Officina da Fratelli Bambi made. So here downstairs uh, there's still uh, an officina, so uh, how La Marzocco was born, where the bespoke machines are, uh, are made. <laughs> so all the machines you see displayed here were made uh, downstairs as our uh, our speech. The reason behind the name, so Vespucci is the name of the... Um, Admiral of the Italian Navy. Amerigo Vespucci? Amerigo Vespucci, exactly. And our CEO is mad about, it's crazy about boats, so uh, ask the, the, the guys to make these. Uh, everything is hand made and folded. I know it uh, looks very simple, but it uh, was a mess to, uh, to make it. They had to try many, many times. And uh, if you take, uh, um, take a look carefully, all the folds of the machines are exactly in the same uh, place of the sh uh, of the folds in the bar. So that this is like very geeky. And uh, these are two machines. So uh, with two different water lines. Hmm. Um, and uh, seven boilers. So one saturated group for each brewing group, plus 
a steam boiler for those three and a steam boiler for those two. Oh. It wants to be like a, a display of some of the technologies we have now and is three stratas, strata EE, so on, off, AV, automatic volumetric, so is the one where you can set the recipes, and MP, mechanical pendle, that works like a... The, the easiest way I found to explain it is a sphere robinet, so the more you open it, the, the more water you get. Mm. <laughs> Here, the most technological part, lever, uh, that is my favorite one. <laughs> Uh, and this is what Strata 2.0 is going to look like, or about. This is a prototype, it's still on now field test, but uh, uh, the, the new Stratas will be something like this. So, I integrated scales in all models, straight in instead of violet, and uh, electronic pedal. So, you, you make the same things of this, but uh, electronically so you, you can follow directly uh, from the display the, the pressure but you can also register the profile and use it like uh, an AV so you, you can replicate uh, um, all, the, all the profiles you found it not easy to, to tell I mean the only way to keep something like that is to get the maintenance uh, <laughs> here is technology compressed there's neither space for a screw inside so yeah it has some weak points is a Frankenstein. <laughs> I guess this is the only one in the world. It is the yeah. only one in the world. <laughs> this is uh, old school depoper. You put the coffee in here and uh, turn the wheel and it squeezes the seed out of the fruit. Well, this has been a really fun experience. The uh, Lama Choco is one of my favorite espresso machines and uh, you know that if you see a Lama Choco machine in a coffee shop they have good coffee. You wouldn't buy a machine for 20,000 uh, euro without really caring about coffee. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. Maybe you learned something. Um, if you did, give me a thumbs up, click subscribe and ring the bell if you want to see what happens next. And uh, I will see you in the next episode. Peace. Should have had that van. Just driving around with that. Put the motorcycle in the back, drive around and just make uh, espresso for people. And then take the bike up to the forest. That would be the life, huh? <laughs>